the, of course, the uh, title of the uh, panel is uh, Lighting a Fire Under Consumer Demand for Clean and Efficient Cooking Solutions. We have a panel from around the world, which we're very excited about today. And um, I just wanted to give a couple of words in the beginning. I, I have to tell you, um, as someone who is involved in this, as they say, present at the creation, um, it's very exciting to see um, all of the members uh, that have come together today to, to work on this. There was a point where we all could have fit in an elevator, um, but, it, but it's really exciting to have people in this room looking at it. And um, I, you know, the press just asked, how is it different than four years ago? Well, there are more people in the room, but there are more people with ideas. This is a global problem with local solutions. And um, I really think that uh, this is one of the rare places where you have a cross-sectoral team here. You know, there's a tendency, particularly in this country, for all of the NGOs to meet with the NGOs, all the foundations to meet with the foundations, all the corporates with the corporates, and the governments with the government. And the only way you get new ideas is when you uh, bring different cross-sectoral teams together to come up with innovation. So with that, I'm going to uh, cut short my comments because we really want to get to audience participation. And I'd love to, to run down uh, our list here, to our, our panel today, and uh, introduce uh, our panel. And maybe they could say a few words of how they got to, to cook stoves uh, uh, a couple minutes. Our first is Sarah Collins, who I met at a Clinton Global Initiative a few years back. She's the founder of Wonder Bag, which, uh, which is right here at our feet. I have, I've had them in my office for many years. Um, and uh, on October 13th, they, they started selling Wonder Bags on Amazon. And it's the uh, most successful public relations exercise ever on Amazon, uh, on their homepage. And they've gone seven straight weeks. And I'm going to... Uh, let um, uh, my friend Sarah tell you a little bit about uh, the success they've had in selling them uh, in the U.S. and globally. Sarah. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, it's a pleasure to be on the panel with you, and I, I know you have put up with me for many years. And um, it was actually said earlier today by Kanda Yumkela from Energy Access for All that um, people like us are tolerated for an hour, two at the max, by corporates that give us a small bit of air time. And um, so since I first met Chris, I've had to look at that and find out how I can become relevant to corporates because that's the only way I believe we can scale cook stove solutions. Um, mine is a very simple heat retention cooker, an ancient old cooking technology brought into the 21st century. It's called a wonder bag. You can Google it. As Chris says, I never go anywhere without it. Um, it's relevant in a Manhattan apartment as it is in a mud hut. Um, and I believe that uh, the future of scalability for the wonder bag is at the intersection of development and commerce. And unless I am commercially relevant to global CEOs of corporate businesses, I'm going to only get an hour or two maximum. So I have taken the mad, naive leap of looking for business case solutions for global corporations that drive revenue to them. So Amazon has already been mentioned. Um, what an unlikely thing for the Wonder Bag to be launched in the US. Well, I believe that individual philanthropy plays a very, very critical role in, um, in development, and that's what we do. It's a buy one, donate one on Amazon. Very successful for Amazon. It makes them look good. It drives traffic. I also work with corporates like Unilever, Pfizer, and various others to find commercial business case solutions that make them more money, and therefore they will, I, I can then scale with them. And we have a massive partnership that is in play at the moment. It will be announced early next year, and it's going to change the face of women empowerment around fires and clean cooking. And it's a very, very exciting um, place to be, but I think the most exciting thing for me is everything that's been said today has validated exactly the direction that so many of us are going. And so I congratulate people like Chris, Hillary Clinton, and others who started this um, alliance all those years ago, and we really are seeing this space 
in an exciting, exciting development. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, do you want to just mention a little bit about uh, the Amazon experience? Oh, <laughs> so you may ask me why, why, why launch on in America? Why launch on Amazon? Um, well, Amazon is first of all slow cooking in America is a huge way of life. People are looking for healthy solutions. But there's a large number of people in America who don't want to leave a slow cooker plugged in. It also represents mushy food and, you know, old-fashioned pulled pork and things like that. So, and people want to be part of the global solution. So, for me, looking at the most advanced technology in terms of shopping, with the oldest technology in terms of cooking was a perfect match. And what Amazon wanted to do was tell the story behind their product. And we are actually one of the, the, the Christmas um, gift uh, guy in, our, in the Christmas gift guide as one of the top sellers with as products with stories behind them. And what it is is it's making Amazon become part of a global solution that is, we all know what the problem is. So how do, how do companies like Amazon and various others become relevant in attacking an issue like this? They find mad innovators like myself who will take products to market and they will then partner and back us to get bags into the Western world and at the same time subsidizing bags in the developing world. We have subsidized over 30,000 bags already this, um, this holiday season. So it's a really exciting initiative. It's only going to grow. Um, and so I think, does that's that great. answer No, that's it? great. So you buy one and you donate one. Yeah. So great. for $57, you go on Amazon. I'm doing a little bit of a s selling pitch now. You go on Amazon and it's the greatest Thanksgiving or Christmas present because not only do you give one to somebody, but one gets delivered in Africa through the Wonder Bag Foundation. It is not about aid. It's about subsidization. And, um, and so we work with partners and the Wonder Bag Foundation is, I'm the CEO of that, so I'm very passionate about the way these are activated and um, implemented within communities. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I have to say, in all of my travels with the State Department, I have never introduced a Queen Mother. So um, it is a great honor to uh, introduce Nana Agya Koma Diffie, who is the Queen Mother of Mompong traditional area in Ghana. And also, I love this title, The Occupant of the Silver Stool of the Ashant Kingdom. And, um, you know, we talked a little bit backstage. Uh, tell us about the position and how your, you know, one of the issues is really getting these clean cook stoves out and, and people feeling comfortable with them. And, and, and feel free to tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Thank you very much. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I'm the Paramount Queen Mother of Mampon traditional area. I'm also the president of the House of the Ashanti Queen Mothers Association. It's uh, an association that comprises of all Queen Mothers in the Ashanti Kingdom that owns allegiance to the Golden Stew and all Otun Force Consult. We've formed the association to get a platform that we can that we can create awareness through women empowerment and other issues that affect women in our community and children as well. And, and the empowerment of uh, so much of you've heard today, and, and you'll hear from my old boss tomorrow, uh, uh, who um, is going to talk about the empower of uh, the Clean Cook Stove Initiative on the empowerment of women. Um, and I think uh, comments were made this morning. It's not only economic empowerment, but social empowerment. And uh, uh, we're looking forward to, to comments uh, tomorrow. And, and, and that's one of the in, uh, things you're trying to move forward on uh, in Ghana, I'm sure. Definitely. Um, as a group, uh, not only is it in our regions, the association is based in the whole Ghana that gives us the ten, all the 10 regions. So we're hoping to be aligned with the, the Ghana Global Association mm -hmm. so we can form an alliance and the Queen Mothers can be ambassadors and they can also create awareness on the effective of clean cook stove. That's great. Well, thank you. And. Um, I wanted to introduce Martha Herrera, the Director of Global Social Responsibility at CEMEX from Mexico. And um, you know, tell us a little, you, you're doing work uh, with a number of NGOs in Bangladesh, Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala. Um, tell us a little bit of, of how a large organization is getting involved. I think, uh, 
our friends are here from Guatemala. I remember being building cook stoves in Guatemala, and, and Semex was very active in, in uh, that role. So, Martha. Thank you, Chris. I'm very happy to be here and enthusiastic part of the Alliance, too. Uh, well, for those of you who don't know, Semex is a, a global company based in Mexico. We, are, uh, we have operations in around 50 countries around the world. And uh, we, we want to contribute to the development of the countries in which we are uh, located by developing uh, sustainable and uh, integral solutions in the construction industry that really helps uh, improve the quality of life of people in these regions. And since uh, around 15, 20 years ago, we began focusing in, uh, in some markets in the lower income segment, uh, developing uh, solutions, uh, models, uh, different inclusive and social businesses, uh, focusing especially in affordable housing, secure housing, um, uh, basic infrastructure, ec eco technologies, and um, sustainable uh, communities. This, all this by uh, empowering women and youth, and by giving technical assistance, by um, trying to contribute to their own well-being, and uh, by uh, developing some uh, different models of uh, saving credit uh, uh, mechanisms. So we have been working, uh, developing more than 20 different social and inclusive businesses, uh, especially in Latin American countries. Uh, we are uh, transferring knowledge to, to other countries in which we operate, as Philippines, Bangladesh. But we, we are working very hard in Latin America. And uh, for, well, we have a big challenge in, in Mexico too. 28 million people cook in open stoves. So we, we have a big challenge in terms of health, in terms of social inclusiveness, in terms of environment problems. So we, we wanted to be part of the solution. So we, we wanted to generate value at the same time for all our partnerships. Uh, so we are doing different things. Innovation, that's one thing in our products. Innovation in, a, in, in some of the, the, the cooking stuff that we are designing and we are partnership with. We are bringing to the table others. We are working together with NGOs, with other companies, with multilaterals, um, with universities around, around the world. And um, we are also bringing together our supply chain. Only in Mexico, for example, we have uh, 3,000 3, uh, supply uh, distributors. So we are working together with them in, in, in this process. Um, we are also, we have a very uh, huge lo logistic platform, so we are bringing that together also. And we are br bringing together the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur which is the, the one that is working together very closely with the community members in try to design, develop different models in which we can include them in our own business. So we're trying to, to work together with others in, uh, since in the promotion, adoption, the campaigns, the, the, uh, and, and of course, in the measurements of this. Uh, I think that's uh, one of the great things we learned in our partnership building at the Global Partnership Initiative was that uh, most people view partnerships uh, as financial partnerships. But in reality, as you just mentioned, they're about networks, about materials, about uh, values, about intellectual property, and great examples. You know, I met uh, Stephen for the first time in the hallway uh, this morning and asked about the bank. And although the bank, uh, uh, they have customers from all over, uh, they do focus on uh, the poor community, the poorest communities. And um, they're doing, the bank is doing fascinating uh, things, uh, Equity Bank in uh, 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 your neck of the woods. And um, I think, uh, it would be very powerful to talk a little bit about cook stoves, but also how you're bringing other products into it too, uh, and how and and your the whole issue of mobile phones, which is very powerful too. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, it's a lot in one one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chris. The issue of uh, uh, improved cook stove uh, is a long one in, in the bank because we have a lot of poor, poor programs, and part of the things that we've been looking for 
is how do you ensure that the poor people or the low income earners are able to gain to be mainstreamed in the normal economic activities. And some of the issues that we came out during interaction with them is that they were spending a good chunk of their energy and time in looking for energy. Uh, in Kenya, we have an unfortunate situation and it has gone, been talked since morning. Our forests are dwindling. There are places there are no trees at all. So even when you're talking about woodfall, it's not available. People are burning plastics, are burning tires, are burning sous to cook. So what that one means is that there is war, especially in the low-income earners, because once one family starts writing such types of fuel, it, it contaminates the whole neighborhood and there is war. When you go to the villages, these forests are no gone zones. You can't go to the forest. So what are they doing? They are stealing hedges and, uh, and fencing, uh, uh, fencing poles to cook. And others are even burning very toxic wood that was used to, traditionally used to burn, <clears throat> to chase away pests and uh, rodents in the houses. So it was a serious ecological and health issues. So as a bank, we found, what do we do to alleviate some of this suffering? Because most of it is even suffering. Forget about even economic, it's suffering. Uh, in Kenya, for those people who have visited there, kitchens are made away from the main house. So it's women and children who literally are condemned to that toxic smoke. So that is a serious ecological and health problem. So the bank decided to venture and to look at how do we help these? Because they are also our customers. They are not able to build their savings. They are not able to venture. They are not able to borrow meaningful loans. So we build a whole energy suit we call Ecomoto Loan. The Ecomoto Loan enables a customer to access solar, improved cook stove, water purification, biogas, and off-grid. But for the purpose of this discussion, I'll, into, uh, I'll talk more about improved cook stove. As a financing institution, we had a huge task. So we had to look for somebody to work with us. We got microenergy credits to help us to recruit credible suppliers of these items. The items, uh, the cook stove that will have a minimum guarantee of two years and a minimum shelf life of five. Because as a financial institution, we didn't want to finance an item and it will be left on our shelves when it is not in use. Then we build in a very uh, innovative loan product that goes to their cycle. And that cycle must fit in lower than their energy budget or whatever they were spending before with those inappropriate energy. So that instead of seeing this item as an expense, it becomes an income because I'm spending less. I'm spending less than I used to spend before. So we are sure it will be continually be, be used by the communities. The next thing is, if you make it look a normal loan, no one will take it. Because people believe normal loans is for buying cows, buying cars, buying plots. So build an innovative loan that they will borrow through their mobile, they will pay through their mobile. So that when it's done, it, it's so easy to pay and to acquire. Then the rest of this, uh, the engagement is get partners, sign up MOU with them, agree so that you fit into their ecosystem, so that you don't be pulling an, a, a partner to come and spend a lot, and spend a lot when they are they're investing. Then you start having war with them. Where is my return? So you get to partners or the producers and manufacturers who you fit into their budget. Then build an ecosystem of suppliers, stockists, and the whole thing now becomes uh, sustainable so that the supplier is happy, the customer is happy, the stockist is happy. The banks occupies that middle space in the triangle of facilitating and ensuring acquisition of green energy that is sustainable, that will be in use, and everybody is a winner. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the last uh, speaker is Ibrahim Hafiz Rayman. Uh, the director of the Energy Resources Institute, Terry. I've been to your office in India, and you were a very gracious host. And you've been in this uh, uh, area for a long time, uh, and not only in the cook stoves, but uh, solar lanterns and, and other products. And um, tell us a little bit about what you've learned over the years in trying to bring this into communities. And, and I should add, you're you're not just in India, but but in uh, Ethiopia and uh, in, in other parts of Africa. 
thank you, Chris. Uh, we have been focusing on issues of uh, household energy for almost now two decades. Uh, in fact, more than two decades. But uh, specifically on on the cook stove initiative, we we had uh, we we have a large program called Lighting a Billion Lives, which had been launched. Uh, about eight years back where we are reaching out uh, solar lighting to, to different households. Uh, we've been able to reach out to roughly 3,000 households in India, 3,000 villages in India and Africa. As part of the cook stove uh, initiative, uh, which is quite recent, uh, in the last one year we have reached out to about uh, 30,000 households in, in India and Africa. Uh, we have focused on the entire value chain, uh, looking at the technology development itself, uh, where where the focus has been to to get into this uh, debate of uh, making the clean available or or, uh, or or clean itself in terms of the fuels, and uh, that is one of the reasons that we had decided we would focus primarily on forced draft stoves. Uh, where, where the the benefits in terms of of exposure are, are much uh, higher compared to to natural draft stoves uh, so we we have as uh, as part of that developed uh, and and trying to put into market uh, seven kind of models while we work on very basic a mud stove with a retrofitted uh, uh, highly efficient combustion chamber to, to a steel stove which is forced draft and is operated through through solar or grid uh, electricity. Uh, the, the experience of course has been quite mixed. The challenges are huge. Uh, we need to look at this entire debate of improved and clean and, and, and that is something which requires uh, immediate attention. Uh, while we can focus on, on making the clean available, I think uh, it is important that for a large number of uh, developing countries, biomass is going to be the mainstay. Uh, electricity and LPG are, are difficult to come by for political reasons, for affordability reasons, and, and uh, creation of market value chains around them are, are going to be difficult. So while, while we focus on the improved, it is important that uh, we, we narrow down the benchmarks and, and quality and standards. Uh, but also critically important is cooking energy needs to be viewed comprehensively at the household level. It cannot be viewed in isolation. It has to be linked to lighting and other immediate needs. And even in terms of the product, that integration is essential. Of the last few thousand stoves that we've done, we've actually integrated a lighting product into stove and the benefits have been uh, much greater. So while we focus on creating entrepreneurship, we now network uh, and work with uh, a, a huge chain of around 200 micro enterprises at the local level who are ensuring and creating the value chain along with uh, financial institutions. I think uh, we, we need to question ourselves when we do the number counting. What is the number that we are counting and what is the quality that we are getting across? Uh, this debate has been divided for, for decades. There's the urban group and there is the rural group. While governments and at national level, there has been a lot of focus on providing LPG and, and making clean available to the urban communities, we've had different set of standards for rural communities. And this discrepancy actually needs to be addressed. Uh, and it certainly cannot be addressed by merely pushing LPG or electricity into uh, this. It requires investment, research and development, and I'll come to that a little later. And, and Terry has j just a huge uh, 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 inventory of, of research based on uh, their many years in this area, so they're very powerful. You know, I wanted to run through quickly what each person on the stage was doing, but I want to take some questions because it's late in the day and we don't want an audience that's just kind of hanging out there. So um, why don't we take a couple questions uh, from the audience. You could direct them 
uh, to individuals or tell us a little, you know, we've we got the lights up here. Anyone so far? If not, I have some. Go ahead. You want to stand up and just tell us who you are, please. I'm Dana Sharon from Berkeley Air Monitoring Group. And my question is from the gentleman from Kenya, from the Equity Bank. Um, I'm curious what happens if people don't pay for their stoves? Um, do you take those stoves back? And is there a market for, a secondary market for used stoves as a result? Great, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the question. And that's an interesting one because that is what most of the financial institutions have been grumbling with. Because a used stove is not easy to sell. So we, what we've done, we, we, we've uh, employed very high level ways of assessing these people through behavior and financial. So the chances of failure, like the first one year we've been running a pirate, we've sold more than 20,000 pieces, uh, 12,000 in loan, 8,000 in cash. There has not been a single, there has not been a single default. So it's very tricky because when somebody doesn't pay, it's supposed to be repossessed. And when it's repossessed, we have an usual arrangement with most of the suppliers that it can be sold through secondary market, that the second hand market. But so far, not yet because our, our providing engine has been very effective. But that's a possibility that if they don't pay, it can be repossessed. Although it's not easy because we also, the ones who we think are high in risk, we do what we call chattel or flexible, uh, for a flexible security, just in case, but not always. So far, so good, because the GCOS has been also been cheap, about from 1800 to 3600 That is from about $20 to about $32. So, so far, so good, but that's a possibility. If they don't pay, it can be processed, but not directly repossessing, is encouraging them to sell to their neighbor through second hand so that they can pay the balance. Thank you. Uh, right here. <clears throat> Why don't you here? Take, take this. But give it back. Hi, my name is Heather Adair Rohani, and I work for the World Health Organization. Um, recently, as noted in, by several people, that there has been um, recent guidelines that come out for um, emissions. And I was wondering, because in the guidelines we specifically uh, address the fact that you have to address all household energy needs to really, and all devices in there to get the health benefits. They all need to reach these emission rate targets, and they all need to reach these standards. Have you tried some integrated packages? Because I know you have your billions of li li the billion lives practice, as well as your cooking. Have you ever tried to actually couple those together and disseminate those to the household as, as, as a group? Yeah, uh, that, that, that is precisely what I was talking about. Uh, what we have done in terms of the product is to have an integrated product uh, where you have solar lighting. So, so there is home lighting system combined with force draft cook stoves. And, uh, and, and that is something which becomes more attractive to the household level. It also becomes attractive to the financial institutions. Uh, because one of the uh, problems that we've been facing with cook stoves is while they, they, uh, some of them tend to be uh, unaffordable for the rural households, uh, for the banks, it's a very small ticket size. So they just don't want to uh, fund such a small ticket size. But when you combine lighting and cooking together, uh, the, the ticket size becomes more attractive to the financial institutions as well. Uh, and that is where all the innovation and, and research needs to come in. Uh, it's not about merely providing 15% uh, or 20% or 25% of thermal efficiency. It's about providing uh, solutions which have tangible benefits, particularly on the health and the environmental side. It's also about that uh, it's biomass that is being used, but there is also kerosene which is being used in the households. Uh, in, in India, almost uh, 60 to 70 percent of the rural households use kerosene in the most archaic lighting devices. And that primarily runs not for two hours or three hours, cooking cycles are three to four hours, that runs for at least 14 to 15 hours every day. And that's huge in, in, in terms. So I, I think it's important that we start talking comprehensively. And, and uh, this, 
merely chasing of numbers is not going to take us anywhere. So while we, we are looking at intermediate solutions, while we can go along with the intermediate solutions, but I think the number counting that we do, we also put specific categories in place and say, also the issue is, you might say we've done, uh, I, I, I was claiming we've done about 30,000 stoves. Now, how long are these 30,000 go stoves going to last? Six months, one year, two years, five years? And, and that needs to be factored in. Uh, with a lot of solar photovoltaics, we say panel is going to last 20 years. Uh, I am sorry with the kind of cook stoves that we have and we've evaluated quite a number of them that are commercially available. It's very difficult to decide on time frames. It could be as low as six months to three months. Uh, it could be high as three to four years, but we don't have concrete data on that. And, and that needs to be factored in. So a lot of the commitment, and I would be happy to sort of take back if, if at least some of the investors and funders can take this, that apart from reaching out and creating the market value chains, equally important at this juncture is to, to invest in some products, invest in research and development, and mind you, the market is not going to take care of it at the moment. The market is too incipient. Uh, the manufacturers are, are, are too small. You don't have big, huge corporations who are investing in cook stoves. Uh, these are small manufacturers who are not going to invest too much into research and development and innovation. That has to happen either through the public sector or it also requires a lot of international collaboration. The best of the labs in US and Europe need to come together to look at this highly efficient combustion technology. Uh, they need to come together to look at processed fuels, highly efficient fuels other than LPG and the use of electricity. Thank you. Questions? Other questions? I had a question. Oh, wait, back. Uh, oh, we have a microphone? Okay, great. Hi, you my name is Regina. stand up so we could see you. Hi, I'm Regina Mead with Mead Pro 4, and we are private investors, and we're looking at this opportunity. However, I'd like for you to address the value chain. It's a fractured chain. I'd like to learn more how you're going to make it more cohesive so you can deploy more of these uh, cook stoves and therefore a wider adaptation of these products. And then I want you to address why should I invest in cook stoves? Because what we look at is the bottom line. Martha, do you want to talk about the value chain or? or well, yeah, for, for, for us it's a very important thing. I mean, um, let me just share a little bit uh, that I am very excited because yesterday we inaugurated our first production facility of cook stoves in Mexico. Uh, this is a, 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 a public-private partnership in, um, that we developed in San Luis Potosí uh, in, 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 um, in, in Mexico. And we're working with uh, the state government, the local government, uh, uh, helps an uh, NGO, and uh, ourselves. But it's, 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 as you said, it's not enough. I mean, uh, we can, we can uh, produce um, 90,000 uh, cookstops a year in that facility. Uh, but we have to do a lot of things in order for to, to, to sell or to locate uh, 90,000 stoves in in in, um, in the in that region. And if, the, if we do that in one year, we finish with the problem in that specific state. But it's it's very difficult because we have to um, create a lot of awareness in the region. We have to work with the women over there. We have to work with our distribution chain. We have to 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 develop cap capabilities on on them too. We have to create a market uh, in which they can also uh, sell the spare parts of the of 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 the cook stops. Uh, we, we have to work with uh, research centers, with universities, in order for, for those, uh, those local ecosystems to, to strengthen and to really uh, uh, make it work. You can comment. Um, I think you ask a very important uh, question, Regina, why should you invest in this space? I think the most important thing is, is that we have three billion women cooking on fires. 
And if you look at the lack of economic empowerment of women globally in the developing world, unless we take women out of poverty, we are not going to have successful policy and, um, and, and stability within those countries. So our first step is to actually get women off fires and into um, more uh, entrepreneurial and economically empowering positions as well as getting girls back into school. And from my perspective, um, and I speak very subjectively here, is, is that the value chain that I've created with the, cook, uh, the cooking solution that I have is that we actually manufacture at source, which means we have job creation in countries that, um, that the Wonder Bag is deployed. We then um, um, have empower entrepreneurs who are women who are also health workers that take vaccines in because it also um, forms part of the cold chain. And then those women become entrepreneurs to actually sell products, consumer products, health products, um, solar lighting products and other and further wonder bags. So we are looking at a whole distribution model, an entrepreneurial distribution model, empowering women out of poverty. And I think that that is the critical key to why we need to invest in this sector. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, on the value chain, I think uh, it's it's important that uh, you are focused on two key aspects. One is that there are local level mi micro enterprises and it's important at this juncture to piggyback on the existing micro enterprises. So for instance, uh, for, for both for solar and cook stoves, we've looked at, at the village level, entrepreneurs who have been dealing with electronics, uh, repair of transistors, repair of tape decks, those are the ones who sort of come into the value chain without too much of uh, additional investment. So it's, it's uh, how you start creating and expanding that last mile delivery value chain. On, on why one should be investing in this, uh, on a very optimistic note, I would say you should be investing from a business point of view, from, from a manufacturer's point of view, because this is an area which has huge potential in terms of the demand. It, it is an area which is now thankfully receiving some of the attention that it has deserved for several decades. So this is a very good time to invest. This is a very good time to innovate. And if you are of the block as one of the first, then you would have that advantage. So, so for investors, for manufacturers, this is certainly a good starting point. And there are bound to be resources and support coming in from the international community. Uh, we are hopeful that there would be support coming in a lot from the private sector as well, as well as from the public sector. Thank you. Thank you. Um, was there another one back there? Another question, I think? Oh, oh right here. Actually, I think we have to use okay. this so that, so that you're on the record. So ah. tell us who you are. Carlos Glatt from Glatt Stove. Could you compare it, the, the cook stoves now, with another industry, for example, the cell phones? Because we have to understand where we are, where we're going, and the best way to do it is comparing ourselves to something else. Excellent question, and there have been uh, a lot of comparisons on this. I, for one, would be very hesitant to compare cook stoves and cell phones. Uh, nowadays, I think it's uh, quite fashionable to give the example of the cell phone industry and how it has sort of uh, penetrated and where we were uh, a decade back. Uh, there are very fundamental differences between the two and for uh, paucity of time, I'm not going to go into details of it. But even if we were to make that comparison, I, I think what is unique here and different is the cell phone industry and the cell phone at that time was not competing with a, some equal option which was non-monetized. So that facility was not at all available. I could not talk to somebody sitting here uh, in India. I, I, I couldn't connect. But 
Cooking is, has been happening for centuries and decades, and it has been happening on those traditional stoves. Uh, so in terms of the, the latent demand, that latent demand is not there. Uh, it requires, it's a very complex issue which requires awareness, which requires reaching out. It also has a lot of locally contextualized things uh, with regard to the technology itself. But suffice to say that from the point of view of any comparison, and, and there the comparison holds true with, with mobile telephony, if you can innovate and provide a product which is sort of leapfrogs in terms of convenience, in terms of some of the issues that women grapple with uh, while cooking, in terms of the time, in terms of the drudgery, and if you can sort of overcome, which LPG does in a way. Now, if, if that technology is available, then of course there, there can be comparisons and you can have that kind of penetration. Affordability issues, local context, all these come into play because we don't have products at the moment. And, and, and cell phone people had a product and they sort of innovated from that product, they improved upon that product. So at the moment we are say several notches below the, where the cell phone industry actually started off from. <coughs> Stephen, I don't know if you had a comment. Uh, I'll comment. Uh, if you compare the cell phone and um, cook stove, I think those two will be two different things. But when you look at the investment opportunities in both, there's some similarity because once now the cook stove industry or sex space is rather not well, there's not a lot of investment. So whatever investment you can put into that, you are sure to reap. And the other good thing, and I, I hope to state it now, is the common good. The moment you are saving humanity, the moment you see uh, climatic change being part of your company's policy, I think it's more fulfilling than just uh, looking at convenience for the sake of convenience. Because now where telephony, uh, or mobile telephone technology is now, they are looking for convenience, convenience, convenience. But when you're in the, uh, the improved cook stove and clean cook stove, you can imagine the kind of lives you are, you are saving now and in future. I think that's my comment. I, I just wanted to ask um, uh, the Queen Mother, what, uh, what barriers do you think exist for women using cook stoves uh, when you uh, proceed with your program? Um, basically, um, Ghana is more of a cultural-based country. And uh, we are very used to our traditions and cultures. We eat the same way we eat. We've been prepared the, f the, way, for the, way, the same way our mother taught us. So there are a lot of challenges when it comes to let, telling people to use new things. But um, as I said earlier on, because uh, as queen mothers we are custodian of tradition, when we, co when we get the right information and the right uh, ideas, and we go back to our people and tell them this is a new way of improved cooking solution, I think they will take it. And uh, once we are ambassadors, we can also start using the stoves in our own palaces. And when people come to us, they see that me being a traditional uh, ruler and being also a custodian of tradition, this is how we used to cook. But now I'm, I've stopped the old way by cooking in the open fire and I'm cooking from an effective cleaner cook stove. Sarah, did you have a? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to comment on something that Stephen said and just um, on comparing us to the mobile phone. And I think that um, one of the things that is going to push uh, the, um, this industry forward and why it's a good investment and um, looking at consumer demand in the world where you actually big corporates have to now look at their sustainability and look at their triple bottom line. What are they doing environmentally? What are they doing socially? But I still think it comes down to a commercial um, reality that they, they still have to make money for their shareholders. And so I do think that the, that corporates are going to push the sector forward fast now because we need to look at different markets to actually make up where the uh, collapse happened in 2008. So the recession has actually po is po forcing corporates to actually look into new markets, which is actually looking at addressing issues in those markets through those very consumers, and we can take the solutions to the consumers with the support and therefore get very good investment.
that route. Okay, this gentleman right here in the, the white shirt, um, I think we're bringing you a mic. Oh, my name is Ashraf. Um, I work for IFC, the International Finance Corporation. My, my question is related to uh, scalability of, of manufacturers. I, I hear a lot of talk about that this is the way we should go forward. But I, I'm, what I'm not sure is that, is, is it, are, there, are we creating any synergies by scaling up the manufacturing? Uh, what, what are the cost savings that a manufacturer can realize from, you know, uh, in, entering maybe Nigeria or India market on, on a very large scale. Are there benefits to, to the manufacturers? Well, I, I think that that's a very difficult question because we took, we're talking about different cooking solutions. So the scalability and the manufacturing of different, for argument's sake, the Wonder Bag is going to be a very different manufacturing and supply chain to another cook, um, a, a cook stove that comes out of... Um, uh, out of Europe. So I think it's quite a complex question, but obviously there's a huge advantage to um, scaling in country and as we develop we're going to bring down the prices and so I think there needs to be a huge amount of pressure to have local manufacturing and local supply chains within all developing markets. Ibrahim? Yeah, uh, I think one of the key issues here and uh, the answer to your question is at the moment, it's not very attractive in a large number of countries. Uh, one of the reasons, for instance, in India, we have been struggling and uh, uh, doing a lot of advocacy with the government to look at the tax structure. Uh, you can't be taxing these kind of technologies the way you are taxing a lot of other products. So in terms of excise duties, VAT, uh, etc., and which sort of comes to about 25% uh, to 30% of the product cost. So those incentives are not yet available in. But at the same time, uh, Government of India is also coming out with, with yeah, as part of the new program, uh, trying to come out with certain in incentivization measures. Uh, one of them could be to, to looking at uh, soft capital being made available to the manufacturers. So that th those are some areas which are still very nascent in a large number of countries in South Asia and Africa, but those are the ones which require attention. And IFC has been working on this in India and in other places, so have we been, but there are a lot of others and there's a lot of space there which we, we, we need to sort of push and, and fill in. Okay. Uh, we have uh, about seven minutes left right here. Uh, yes, my name is Richard Grinnell. I am uh, the president of the Cluster for Clean Cook Stoves in Guatemala. And uh, I am listening, and I'm, you know, in the in previous uh, presentations as well, uh, on why invest and how to invest. And I, you know, we, we've talked about three billion people living uh, with open fires or cooking with biomass fuels, which means about uh, 600 million households uh, uh, cooking this way. So there's a huge need but there is no demand or very little demand. So, I mean, and I, you know, cell phones, I agree, are totally different. You're not substituting something. You don't have to de-learn to relearn later. But for instance, the Coca-Cola company, they, you know, took a, a lemonade. I was wondering why you're holding that prop. That was very. <laughs> yeah. So they took lemonade and they had substituted for Coca-Cola and created a desire in you to buy this. And uh, what I've seen and uh, what I've noticed over the years in the stove industry is that there is very little advertisement what creates that desire to buy. How do we create demand? How do we uh, do synergies with uh, corporate uh, uh, people that have the ability that know how to market, that know how to advertise, uh, and uh, they're, I mean, any product that is sold out there commercially has that element. Instead, we, we don't have, uh, the, the sector does not have the income to create that advertisement, to create that desire. So, you know, wh where should we go with that? 
Um, if I can just address that, I mean, I think that that's exactly the point that I'm making, is, is that we have to partner So, with big corporations. So I'm going to use a very specific example. Is Unilever, I bundle the Wonder Bag with, with, Wonder, ba the Wonder Bag with Unilever products, which are food products. And they then get the message out there. One of the things I would like to sort of disagree with you is that one of the issues that we have in Africa is that the choices are being taken away. We are running out of fuel in Africa. So people are unable to cook long cooking food that they've traditionally have cooked. So there is a move towards fast food purely out of necessity. So that has shifted recently. And that is why it is imperative that we now partner with the likes of Unilever, Coca-Cola, your big guys that know how to distribute. And that's what we have to do. And that's what I, my sole focus for the next five years is to scale up in partnership with these big corporations. Otherwise, we don't have a chance of actually reaching our goal of moving those 600 million people off fires. Other, uh, An another way is uh, to, to really partnership with the government. I think governments can do a lot in uh, campaigning. Um, uh, for example, in, in the states that we are participating, we, we did a, a research in which, uh, well, we stated, uh, first of all, this is the fourth cause of death in Mexico. Um, and um, uh, when, when you use prevention as uh, the cook stops, which is a preventive uh, uh, um, product, um, you, you then say, well, if you're going to, to um, save this kind of money uh, in the health uh, sector, you can put a little bit of that in the campaigning. So, it's, it's not easy, but we are going to do that. Of course, we are going to be part of that as a corporation. But we, want, we need to push the government to also invest on, on these campaigns. We have about three minutes. Uh, last question right here. Hi, my name is Carmen Salguero from Guatemala Alliance for Nutrition. Uh, we've had at least a decade of social programs uh, funded by government, international cooperation, giving away stuff, giving away remittances, money, and uh, cook stoves, food. Uh, so going to the question of my, um, of my uh, friend here, how do we, is there any systematized models of making this work where people, when you approach communities, they, they put the hand like this, and what are you bringing me for free? And we are engagement in this behind the national plan in Guatemala for clean cook stoves is not nada gratis, nothing for free. So we want to engage in a smart way as private sector, but we, we, we know it's difficult raising awareness, but uh, how do we get families at the bottom, bottom of the pyramid, those families that make less than $300 per month of income, to allocate small amounts to, to purchase their, their, their cook stoves when they are, do not have access to uh, small loans, by the I, way. I, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ibrahim? I, yeah, uh, I, I think it's a... Note that you have two minutes. Uh, I'm just it, kidding. It's a chicken and egg situation, but uh, I, I think more than advertising, it's at this juncture, and uh, I, I'll give the example of the polio campaign, uh, which uh, was run by celebrities in India. So at this juncture, in terms of, of campaign, you require a campaign. That campaign needs to be led by celebrities. You, you require very strong brand ambassadors who are able to, to connect with the importance. And you equally require good products. If there is a combination of these two, then you would be creating a demand. And, and that demand creation is essential at this stage. Uh, at the moment, we, have, we don't have those kind of ambassadors. We don't have those kind of campaigns, as well as there is a lacuna in terms of the products. And, and these two areas need to be worked upon. Uh, Martha? Mm, just to, to make a point on, um, on that question, I guess putting the women at the center and trying to work out with uh, income for, um, for the women, for example, in our uh, affordable housing and cook stops, we have in, in Mexico, more than 3,000 women participated in the program 
All of them are part of a, a, a program in which they are promoters of the program and they, uh, uh, if, if they sell uh, products and services, they had a, a, an income in, a, in, in a, their own materials for their home or, or a cookstop. And that way you, you began um, uh, promoting this uh, 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 door by door and you began created this ecosystem with uh, women and families. And, um, and uh, that's the way we, we created this model for the lowest uh, of the low and the pyramid for, for housing. Uh, working through women, empowering women and youth. Um, we're out of time. Uh, but I, I would just note that there are a lot of, I know I have the, the good fortune of knowing many people in the room, and there are a lot of uh, people who could answer many of these questions. So I hope you'll use the reception and the breaks to, to really go around and ask these questions to many people in the room. It is a great group of uh, people. Thanks for being a great audience. And I think we're going to go on to our last session before the uh, uh, reception. So thank you all for sticking with us at the end of the day here. Thank you.